Try to remember to give you a heads up when you get there. The first case is Rainey versus State. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Steve Gregoza. I'm the Special Assistant Public Defender for Mr. Rainey. I'd like to reserve five minutes. Sure. The, the primary issue I raise here is a fundamental issue of uh, a verdict for him in a, in a jury trial. Do you mind speaking a little bit more into the mic? It more. could be my ear. Yeah, I'm just having trouble hearing you. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the primary issue I have here is the fundamental uh, uh, issue of information and a verdict form. In this case, the state charged Mr. Rainey with uh, a scheme to defraud. So you, you think the vi victim should have been identified on the verdict form? Is that the gist of your issue? Right, and the information didn't identify who the victims were. The verdict form didn't, didn't identify who the vic vic victims were. All we have in the, is a trial where the state put on some evidence related to 11 people but we don't know which ones, the the jury, which ones the jury found happened. Right. Was it unanimous? Did they agree on that? Do all of them? Was it unanimous as to some and not others? Right. And, and, you know, I also thought of another issue when I was preparing for this. It just came up. And, and the issue comes that I think is if the jury found Mr. Rainey guilty as charged in the information, and the information does not charge any identifiable people. Well, what the jury actually found him guilty was of, sc of, scheme, of a scheme to defraud unidentified people, which, well, of course, I think is... You, you don't have a case that says... I, I, no, I... I and, and there was no statement of particulars filed. That's correct. And identity and of the that's victim. right. And there was no request on the jury instruction that identify the victims, because only some of the victims testified. That's correct. And the way I read the statute, the statute prohibits the scheme itself. It doesn't require identity of victims. Well, I, I disagree with the court. Uh, the court requires that, that the jury charges and the information charge a specific, a specific charge a person. They have to scheme to defraud a person. It's not well, a... Well, one or more persons. One or more persons. So well, they need a person. Well, yeah, that's a human being. That could, that's a victim. That's well, not a named victim. Right, but, they, but they, we don't have no... The information doesn't identify any victims. So you think that's fundamental error on the face of the record because the attorney didn't ask for victims to be named in the verdict form? Well, I'm not saying because the attorney didn't ask for it. I'm saying because the state didn't charge it. So they state didn't charge. They didn't. Well, char this, is, this, is, this is what you just thought up last last night. Well, no, I didn't finish what I was. What I was okay. saying is, if the jury found him guilty to uh, scheme to defraud of unidentified victims or persons. And the state put on evidence of identified victims. I suggest in the converse, the jury saying they didn't buy the jury's argument these are victims because they didn't identify them, which means they said he was not guilty of these victims. But they never, the jury didn't. No, I agree. Yeah. But I'm saying, but they, I'm saying when you look at what they did. Better off, I think you're better off with your All right, I'll stick argument with that brief, then. you know what I'm saying. All right. Well, I need to put um, Well, I mean, I can see, you know, you've got, so you've got 10, 10, I don't know how many alleged victims were here. So. And the jury might have believed he was engaged in a scheme to defraud five of them. Were they unanimous? Well, they might have unanimously felt that way. They might have ununanimously felt another way. But, but if you got, though, like a total restitution award as if they were all defrauded. Well, but they, the ju judge gave the restitution award. And I, had, I think there's well, a problem with that, that, too, yeah. because we don't even know which victims are which victims right. for what. So I don't, I, don't think, I don't think the record's clear or anything there. Yeah. And, you know, and they still have to be unanimous. What if the jury said there was, a, the, the jury was unanimous to one person? What if they were unanimous to 10, but there's 11? Well, they were unanimous as to the charge. As well, well there's a single charge. There's a single charge, and if they get a unanimous, uh, you know, for like one or they're more, saying that got he, a scheme he to committed defraud, a but. Right. He committed a scheme to defraud but they're not unanimous. There's no indication of unanimity as to any individual who was schemed to fraud. And the, and the statute does require a person. Right. So who, who was it? And I, I suggest that's the error. All right. All right. So I'll reserve the rest of my time. All right. Thank you. May it please the court. Good morning. Donna Coe for the state of Florida. There was no fundamental error in the form of the verdict form. 
And as Your Honor rightly noted, it was actually agreed upon by defense counsel at trial, the form of the verdict form. But the answer really lies when you look at the language of the statute. Well, what if you got like two victims, two alleged victims, and you got five jurors said, oh, yeah, he defrauded the first one. And then five jurors said, yeah, he defrauded the second one. It's not what the jury had to decide in this case. The jury instructions that the court gave were the standard jury instructions from the Supreme Court, and you had to find two things. They're always on. Uh-huh. You had to find two things, a scheme to defraud and that property was taken. And then, of course, you had to break down it in the aggregate amounts. But so the jury did not have to decide in this case who the individual victims were. Well, I'm not saying that they had to decide the identity. Right. But when you braid them to a bunch of people, I think Mr. Gregosa's point is that they could have less than unanimity as to any of those victims and, indeed, as to all of them. But altogether, they agreed that he defrauded someone. Okay. Given that the verdict form follows the jury instruction, they only had to find a scheme to defraud. What's probably happening is that the appellant is conflating the concepts of constitutional insufficiency, i.e., the verdict form, with evidentiary sufficiency. Well, who are these victims? How much restitution they get? Oh, that's not what's happening. That's not what actually is happening here. There are two separate concepts being conflated incorrectly. And the reason it probably arose, because I've been thinking a lot through what he's trying to argue, and you're right, there's absolutely no case that talks about it or that makes it a burden of the state to set forth each individual victim, either in the information or in the verdict form. But what happened at the sentencing hearing, and it was a sentencing hearing, it wasn't a restitution hearing, the state presents two of the victims. The state said, we're going to ask the court to give us a 30-year sentence. We're not asking for restitution. And the state put on two of their victims, two of the victims that we can go into detail if you want. I don't think it's necessary. One of the victims was Tracy Humphrey, the one that was out $153,000, never got her RV, never got her money. And the other was Lenora Lundy, the woman who ended up calling Channel 8. Both of those witnesses were questioned by the state, and they both said they did not want restitution. They wanted a full sentence in prison, Your Honor, for the full amount of time. So the judge listened to that, and he noted it. They don't want restitution. But then what happens is defense counsel comes in and presents probably 10, at least 10 witnesses who knew the appellant and said, oh, Your Honor, you really need to think twice about this long prison term in lieu of restitution. If you give the appellant opportunity, he's going to be able to get a job, and he's going to be able to pay restitution to these victims. That really is the better outcome here for everybody. So then defense counsel begins the conversation about, well, who are the exact victims, and how much restitution is owed to all of these victims? So this is an issue actually created by the appellant. So what the judge says, the judge says, well, you know, here's the people the state then says, here, Mrs. So-and-so is out this, Mrs. So-and-so is out this. But the judge says to the appellant, do you want a restitution hearing? We'll have a restitution hearing. And the appellant says no. So this issue where there's actually a conflation of these concepts, an evidentiary concept about the amount of restitution, who the victims were, is really a wholly separate issue than the constitutional issue of whether the verdict form is fundamentally flawed. And I have personally not seen any case where the state is actually charged in these scheme of fraud cases to name each individual victim in the information. Well, it's not required as an element of the crime as I read the statute. You have little a and one, but then you have a definition of scheme to defraud, which is where he's getting the intent to defraud one or more persons. But that's not one of the elements. That's part of a definition. Exactly. 
Yeah, and, yeah, and but if that's the definition, doesn't that suck it into what you've got to show? If it, you know, if, 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 if a scheme to defraud is defined like this, and you allege a scheme to defraud, you've incorporated that definition, have you not? The, the jury had to determine if there was an ongoing course of conduct right. whereby people were either defrauded or property was taken away by various misrepresentations of pretenses of, of future conduct of the appellant. And the state's case, which was about 1,600 pages of trial transcripts and then another 800 pages of documents showing bankrupt records and contracts that these people <coughs> entered into to consign their vehicles. I mean, the state's case was detailed about what happened to these various people. But ultimately, what all of that evidence simply did was to establish the two elements the state had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt at the end of the day. A scheme to defraud, which we have defined as an ongoing course of conduct, and that property was indeed taken. There is no part of the jury instruction or the verdict form that requires the jury to have determined who these individual victims were at the end of the day. That was not part of one of the elements from the jury instruction. The verdict form followed the jury instruction. So the state's position is simply a conflation, incorrectly, of an evidentiary burden on restitution with the constitutional uh, requirements here in the verdict form. I don't have anything else to add in that regard. Uh, I hope I've answered your questions and allayed your fears. Um, I do want to add that uh, the um, appellant has not offered any argument before this court on issue two. Um, I, I, it would be objectionable if the appellant were allowed to um, offer any kind of argument because um, then I wouldn't have the opportunity to... Well, let's see if he does. I don't think he's going to do that. He, he, okay. he said he was going for issue one when okay. he started, right? Well, then as far as issue two, um, I do want it... I'm not going to offer an argument, but I do want to um, tell the court that it is limited to the narrow issue um, about what the trial court ruled, which was very evident once you read the reply brief, that it's very, very narrow in focus. And um, that issue was not raised at trial, it would have to be reviewed for fundamental error. So if the court doesn't have any more questions, I'll ask you to affirm. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. Uh, you know, I would only like to add that, uh, or at least I, I suggest to the court, that you cannot have a scheme to defraud unless there's a victim. Well, I mean, the statute says one or more persons. Right. Right? But And you're saying they have to identify these people by name. Well, how do you know? It's got to be unanimous. How you yeah, know? but that's where you go. I'm not so concerned about like the information. I think the information was, you know, certainly legally. But when you put on all of the, all the evidence of all these different victims that you create without then having corresponding uh, questions on the jury verdict, then you do create the problem. As you point out, you create the possibility of a non-unanimous verdict. Now you don't know that the verdict was non-unanimous. No one. It was a verdict. The jury was polled here, and of course, if it was polled, it wouldn't be asked that question. But creates a possibility, but not unanimous. Right, that's my argument. All right, thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both.